God, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for bringing us into each other's lives. And uh, we have so much to be thankful for, even though it's sad when we see our brothers and sisters leave. We know you have a plan for them. And the peace that's inside of them, they will take with them and share it with others there. So we just pray that your kingdom would continue to expand as you take um, these precious ones to us, to your place of ministry for them uh, in the next uh, uh, chapter of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Ten-year-old Lindau, Lindau and her family live in uh, North Vietnam where her father is a pastor. Um, one day, the authorities showed up at her house because they were suspicious of the activity that her father was involved in. This is what she said. I remember when the police came. They searched around the house all that morning and asked many different questions. It was scary to talk to the police. But I knew what they were looking for, so I concentrated and used my best and, and uh, tried my best not to be scared or nervous. When the policeman decided to take my dad away, all my family knelt down and prayed. I prayed first, then my sister, then my mom, and last of all, my dad. I prayed that my dad would have peace and remain healthy and that my family would survive these hard times. Now, when the police come to your house, maybe you've experienced this, whether it's police or firemen and EMTs, they come to your house, the neighbors call, kind of want to know what's going on. So Lindau's friends were no different. They wanted to know what crime he committed. They wanted to know why the police came and arrested her father and took him away. They had all heard that he got a seven-year sentence. And so Lindau spent the next several years saying, my father is not a criminal. Now, if anyone had reason to feel forgotten by God, it would have been Lindau. Now, think about it. What if that had happened to you or to someone in your family? What would you do? How would you respond? Well, I personally might be tempted to do the very thing that Jesus tells us that we should never do. I would be tempted to surrender to an emotion that Jesus tells me I shouldn't. Jesus says, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. Now, my friend Randy and I were talking about this sermon a week or so ago. And he said he looked up the word anxious in the dictionary. And, and what he saw was that to be anxious is to be agitated. Made him think of a washing machine, which I thought was a really great illustration. So I want to share it with you. In the center of the, the, the bowl or whatever it's called that the, you, know, you put your dirty clothes in is what is known as an agitator. And what it does is it spins violently back and, back and forth. And the purpose of it is to, to grab a hold of the clothes and separate the dirt from the clothes. And it foams up and it's just unsettled and it's uncertain and it's unstable. That's what it means to be anxious. But it's something that happens on the inside. This is a definition. You won't find this in a dictionary. This is my definition of anxiety. Because I am a lifelong practitioner. Anxiety is an inner agitation that makes a normally confident person feel confused, unsettled, insecure, and uncertain. Now the problem with Jesus telling us, do not be anxious, is when he says it to us, and we choose to be anxious anyway, guess what we're doing? Somebody tell me, what are we doing? We're sinning. We're disobeying a direct command from God. So, as I have been processing this, uh, fessing up early on that I'm a lifelong practitioner, but it's something that I know God has deal been dealing with me for years. And it hit me that if you're like me, you might say, oh great, now I have to feel anxious about feeling anxious. <laughs> now it's even worse inside of me. The agitator's going more crazy. It's on hyper speed. You may think, Jesus is not fair. 
He does not know what I'm facing. He's in heaven, safe and sound, with nothing to feel anxious about. So how can he tell me not to feel anxious? Or more to the point, why is it sinful for me to feel anxious? Isn't it simply part of the human condition? Before I move on, I want to say that I'm not speaking to my brothers and sisters who are clinically anxious. It can be that we have some chemical imbalance and we need medication to deal with that anxiety. But I also want to say to my brothers and sisters, you don't get to hide behind that if you are just simply not trusting God. Because I told you I'm a lifelong practitioner. I've struggled with this a lot of my life. There are times I wake up in the morning feeling, feeling shame and feeling guilt and I didn't do anything wrong. Anybody identify? Don't raise your hand. It's just enough for me to say it, okay? But I am not clinically anxious or depressed. I am simply a follower of Jesus who struggles to remember that God can be trusted. I think that's where most of us are. But if you need medication, I'm, I'm certainly not saying don't take it. I'm saying that I think God has a plan for his people that will help us be stronger in the peace that's in us so that we can be what he says we should be, which is peacemakers. But we will never be peacemakers until we are peace experiencers. We have to allow him to bring that peace into each and every one of us. Now, while Jesus was here, he had lots of opportunities to be anxious. I mean, think about it. Lots of people loved him, but the religious leaders were looking for a way to discredit him, and when they couldn't do that, they started, they started looking for ways religiously to take his life and silence his voice. Jesus had no steady stream of income. Anybody ever felt that way? Ever produce anxiety in you? Jesus had opportunity to have anxiety. I suspect that among his 12 followers, there were times that he could have been anxious about what they might say, especially Peter, what they might do, especially Judas, who was in charge of the money bag, or the, thuns, the, the sons of thunder, who got their name because they didn't know when to shut up either. He had good cause among his guys to feel anxious, and yet he did not. How do I know that? Because not only did he have those situations going on in his life, but he had situations like this one from one of the Gospels where we read that Jesus, after a busy day of ministry, was just wiped out. And as soon as his head hit the pillow in the boat, he passed out, and this is what happened. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? Now, let me pause there for just a second. I don't know if this was a storm caused by Satan trying to take out the Son of God, or if it was a, a storm sent by his knowing, loving Father to rock his son to sleep. Sometimes storms come in our lives, and we think it's the devil. And it could be the Father trying to draw something out of us that we don't know is there because he knows it's the only way we will listen. He knows it's the only time we'll get on our knees and stop talking and listen. He got up, he rebuked the wind, 
He said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Now they've been with Jesus for quite a while. Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Why wasn't Jesus anxious? How could he sleep? I mean, I'm not talking just the storm. The boat is rocking back and forth. But when you are sleeping and cold water hits you in the face, don't you wake up? This was not a boat like a boat, you know, he went down below and it was all cushioned and it was all enclosed and he was dry. No, this was open. The boat's going nuts. The agitator is going crazy. Water is hitting him in the face and everywhere else. The cushion that might have been dry when they started out was now soaked and he's sleeping anyway. How could he sleep? How could he do it? Didn't he know that they were about to die? I kind of think that Jesus probably knew something about this storm and about the storm that, that broils inside each of us that he wants us to learn today. What does Jesus want to teach us? To find the answer, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We'll start in verse 25. It's on page um, 679 in the Pew Bible in front of you. If you don't happen to have a Bible, you don't own a Bible, please take this, this uh, Bible and use it today. And if, you, if you'd like to, take it home as our gift. We would love to put the Word of God in your hands. We're going to read this together. Start in verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which, is, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? So let me remind us of the hard truth. Anxiety is sin. Because when I'm anxious, it reveals two habits of the heart that are sinful. And when we nurse these habits of the heart, then peace flies away and anxiety takes its place. First, my anxiety reveals my distrust of God. He points out here that he built into creation um, the means by which everything is cared for. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers, he says. Now, the birds are industrious. I have, have heard that a robin has to eat 70 worms every day or else it dies. That's industrious. I don't think I could choke down one. <laughs> but God designed them that way. They're industrious. They, they do the work that they need to do because God put them together that way. So he's saying to us, stop worrying and rest in God. What good has worry ever done you? What good have, has worry added an inch to your height? Now, as a man who is vertically challenged, this is something I've worried about. And it's done me no good because I've discovered from my older brothers and sisters that as I get older, I will no longer be 5'7", which I stretch to. I will soon be shorter than that because height compacts as you get older. 
But if I worry about it, can I add an inch to my life, to my height? Some of us worry about weight. Can worrying subtract an inch from my waist? No. Can worrying add a second to my life? No. So why do we give so much time to it? Why? It is vain, Psalm 127 says, for you to rise up early and retire late, to eat the bread of painful laborers, for he gives, listen to this, to his beloved even in their sleep. You're worried about having enough money for retirement. You're worried about getting, working enough to get the A and get on the list and get the thing or whatever it might be. God, your Father, wants you to be at peace and not anxious because He will give to you even in your sleep. That's what He says. At camp, I taught the kids a 3D process for decision make, good decision making. First you discover, you look at, we, we were talking about music and the, the media we put in our heads. You look at what, you're, what, you're, what you have, what's, who's your favorite group. We talked a little bit about Linkin Park because their lead singer committed suicide a week or so ago. And we talked about some of the lyrics and some songs that are out there. So we discover. Then we discern. Is this something that will, that will strengthen you in your faith? Or is it something that's going to tear you away from your faith, tear your faith down? It, will it produce peace or will it produce anxiety? And then here's the hard part. We decide. You decide, will I follow Christ? Will I take this word? It is vain for you to rise up early, retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in their sleep. Will you believe that? Do you believe it? It doesn't matter if you discern the right if you do not choose to follow the right. We have too long allowed our emotions to tell us what is true. The heart is always a great follower, but it's never a great leader. We choose by the force of the will God gave us to believe his truth, and then he drills it down into our hearts and souls to where we know it, and it's true. 1 Peter 5, 7. I like the um, Phillips Modern English version of this. It says, you can throw the whole weight of your anxieties upon him, for you are his personal concern. Why should I worry when the God of the universe has my back? Why? So let me tell you what one of my friends would say to me when I would tell him I'm struggling with something that I've been struggling with for a long time. He'd very calmly, very gently put his arm around me and he'd say, Stop it! <laughs> Believe God. We have a choice. Decide. I'm going to take God at his word. I'm going to to believe God. So the first thing that you and I can do if we are going to be at peace, if we're going to experience what God wants for us is we are going to choose to trust God. Lynn Dow and her family are an example. She said as each day passed, excuse me, she would make a, a, a mark on her wooden bookcase as she prayed for her father. She said, I prayed every day and night, and my faith grew fast. I knew one thing that I had to concentrate on, and that was spending time learning from the Bible so that when I grew up, I could be like my dad, sharing and preaching. When I think about this, I, I feel my heart burning inside me, pushing me, telling me that this is the right thing to do. Instead of letting anxiety control her, what did she do? She focused on the word. 
we, when we follow our emotions, we are allowing our emotions and the world to squeeze us into its mold. But when we choose to follow God's word, we are allowing him to transform us, to make us more like Christ so that whatever comes our way, whatever storm is coming our way, we can handle it because we're handling it in the Spirit of God and through the Word of God. Legendary preacher Charles Spurgeon, who was also a lifelong struggler with depression and anxiety, I might add, said something that I have on my computer because, as I told you, it's something I've struggled with. Our anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It only empties today of its strengths. And when you are anxious, guess what? When the battle comes, you will run. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. Fatigue often comes because we are allowing ourselves to be anxious. We are in the battle Look around. The morals of our country are falling apart. And our job as followers of Jesus is not to, to just be about electing the right people and just be about getting the right laws on the books and those sorts of things. We should be about that as good citizens. But our job is to push into God to allow the peace that he promised us to be here so that it can then be there so that we can walk into the battle and we can fight with prayer and love and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control, not with our fists and with our guns. Though if we're called to that, we should be ready for that as well. But the main weapons we have, because the enemies we have, are not physical. The people we are against are not the people that are a catty corner from us. They have been fooled by the enemy. Our enemy is the devil himself and the world and our own flesh. And God has called us to enter into that battle with love, with joy, with peace, with kindness, with goodness, with self-control, allowing him to be in charge of us by allowing him to be our Prince of Peace. I've told you this story before, and some of you may remember it, so forgive me. When Colin, our oldest son, was about four years old, we had a doctor's appointment. Um, we'd had a couple, we, there were some things going on, he, and, and we weren't really sure what was going on, but this one, Connie and I talked, she said, I'll go to this appointment on my own, you don't need to come. Well, while she was at the appointment, I was praying for them, and, and the phone rang, and she said, Len, are you sitting down? And I said, well, yeah, I'm sitting down. She's like, well, Colin's gonna have to have open heart surgery. And first I felt guilty because I wasn't at the appointment. I should have heard that news with her. But then I, I just didn't know what to do with it. Maybe you can relate, the anxiety just flooded over me. And I had the radio on in the background, and an old Rich Mullins song came on. And the, these are the words that I heard. So hold me, Jesus, because I'm shaken like a leaf. You've been king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? I didn't come up with that. I couldn't. But I held on to it. I discerned and I decided. And he's been that Prince of Peace. Struggling with a sin is not the problem. Giving in to that sin, that's the problem. Choose to trust God. The second sinful habit of the heart that anxiety reveals is my unwillingness to accept God's agenda for my life. I don't trust God, which is bad enough, but I don't trust God's agenda for my life. The second part of Matthew 5 says this, or Matthew 6, excuse me. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Instead, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, 
and everything that you need will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What is God saying to us here? He is not saying that you should not go to college, Joseph. He's not saying that you should not work hard. That's not at all what he's saying. Matter of fact, those things are gifts from God. He says this, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and to be good for while, they, while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in his toil or labor or his work. This is the gift from God. He also, later on, Solomon says um, in, in Ecclesiastes 5, Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift from God. After all, Moses told the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 8.18 that it is God who gives us the ability to create wealth. Our problem is we forget that God gave us that ability. We say to ourselves, I earned the degree, I put in the hours, I earned the wages, and we forget where it came from. We, We end up living to work and we out ourselves. We're not simply enjoying God's blessing of work, We stop trusting God as the one who provides for us and we slide into the driver's seat. And go ahead and hit that next slide, Brian. We fall into the trap of the great theologians from Disney who tell us this. Well, we're not hearing it. You all who've seen this movie, what are they saying? Mine, 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 mine. That's mine. God has given us the ability to create wealth. God is the one who gave you the ability to learn the complex things you'll need to learn or that you have learned. Every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven, from the Father of heavenly lights. Every single thing we have has been gifted to us by God. It's not just those who are younger, still in school. It's not just those who are in their prime wage earning years. If you are retired, you are susceptible to a lack of trust in God as well. You can show that you don't trust God's agenda when you use your accumulated wealth or your vast amounts of discern, um, excuse me, uh, discretionary time for your purposes without consideration for what God has in mind. Did Jesus really die for us to sit at home, watch TV, go camping, eat out all the time, have a comfortable retirement, take lots of great trips, play golf, memorize all the I Love Lucy reruns, Did he have something more profound in mind when he told us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Or as we are regularly say, on earth in my life as it is in heaven. God provides for us, even giving us the ability to create wealth, and our focus should be on verse 33 to seek his kingdom and his righteousness and let him add everything else to us, whether we are students in the prime wage earning years or retired. John Calvin, theologian that a lot of theology is based on nowadays, had this to say about what it means to be part of God's family. He said, if we then are not our own but the Lord's, it is clear what error we must flee and whether we must direct all the acts of our lives. We are not our own. Let us, excuse me, let not our reason nor our will therefore sway our plans and deeds. We are not our own. Let us therefore not set it as our goal to seek what is expedient for us. 
We are not our own. So in as far as we can, let us forget ourselves and all that is ours. Conversely, we are God's. Let us therefore live for him and die for him. We are God's. Let his wisdom and will therefore rule all our actions. We are God's. Let all the parts of our life accordingly strive toward him as our only lawful goal. Oh, how much <clears throat> has that man profited who having been taught that he is not his own has taken away dominion and rule from his own reason that he may yield it to God. For as consulting our self-interest is the pestilence that most effectively leads to our destruction, so the sole haven of salvation is to be wise in nothing and to will nothing through ourselves but to follow the leading of the Lord alone. When I feel anxious, I choose to trust God. I remind myself that I am God's son. My anxiety is a clue that I need to reframe my thinking biblically. I need to choose to decide to follow him. My core motivation for living every moment of my life is God sent his son to save me by grace. And now I am part of his family, so I'm motivated to please him. I choose to trust God, and then I live to please him. That is what he wants me to do. I taught at Camp Idrahaji, as I mentioned earlier, last week. 137 fourth to sixth graders was a great time. It was, it was rainy. It was crazy. They were up, they were down. It was an incredibly great experience. And the counselors and the team of people that, that led these students were phenomenal. And so one morning, I went and bought them donuts. And I sat there while they hungrily grabbed after the donuts like a bunch of piranha. <laughs> and I had this inner dialogue going on. Wow, why did I waste the money? They don't appreciate it. They're not grateful. No one said thank you. What made it even worse was that some of them thought the gift came from somebody else. I tried to think of some sly way to let them know that I was the one who bought the donuts. And as I'm hearing myself carry on this conversation, happily inside, not outside, I noticed my anxiety level was rising. And God's Spirit put His finger on me. He reminded me of this sermon that I'm writing about anxiety. And, uh, you know, when I say that God spoke to me or the Spirit prompted me, it's not like I'm hearing voices. I don't need medication. But this is what I felt like the Spirit was prompting me with. He said, Len, who did you give the donuts to? Didn't you say you were giving the donuts to me? then why should they, they say thank you to you? Why don't you do this, Len? Why don't you just live to please me? By the way, Len, I'm pleased when you give gifts and don't expect anything back because that's what I do. Lindau's prayers were answered. Her father was released early before he had served all seven years of his sentence. She says, it was a big surprise when I came home from school one day and saw my dad and that he realized that he'd been released from prison. I ran and gave him a huge hug. We were so happy. I was so proud of my father, so proud of my family. I wanted to yell and tell the whole world that I wasn't scared of anything because God had always protects me has, has always protected me each step of the way in my life. Lindau is now a teenager. She wants to follow in the footsteps of her father and be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus. She knows firsthand the dangers of sharing her faith in communist Vietnam, and she remains determined to obey Christ rather than men. Now listen to this. 
in spite of a grim future, she spends her time in intense Bible study. How do you react when the agitator's churning? When the anxiety is building up? I think Jesus taught us and Lindau showed us that God dispels our anxiety when we choose to trust him and live to please him. I don't know what God might be putting his finger on in your life, but I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to decide right now I'm going to choose to trust him and I'm going to live to please him. But I know that you won't be able to do it by yourself. I'm going to ask you to do one of two things, ideally both. Think about someone that you could share life with, one person, maybe two, and begin praying about whether or not you could enter into a mutually beneficial discipleship relationship with them. In a month or so, we're going to be starting life groups back up. On top of a mutually beneficial one to two person discipleship relationship, you might consider be part of our life groups. Maybe you're thinking, Lynn, I don't want to just be part of one. I want to lead one. I just want you to think about that. I want you to pray about it. And we'll have more details as we come along. Because the Christian life was never meant to be a solo thing. You can't learn how to be a follower of Jesus by correspondence. We need each other. Father, I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you so much for all the things that he has been doing in my life and in our lives and in our church. Lord, I pray that you will teach us to trust you and remind us that we live to please you. May you be pleased with the lives that you've given us and how we use them. In Jesus' name.